I bring you good news of great joy. A Savior has been born to you. Hallelujah. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Alleluia. He is Christ, the Lord. Alleluia. We will worship and adore him. Alleluia. The Old Testament reading this morning is from the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah, starting at the 10th verse. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, And as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. For you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman so shall your sons marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Alleluia. We stand to hear the good news of our salvation as written in the gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. The gospel reading is from the first chapter of the gospel of John, starting at the first verse. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everything, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from the fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is in the Father's side has made him known. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to Christ our Savior. 
The sermon text today is Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all of the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Let us pray. Lord, I pray that you would use me as your instrument to proclaim the truth of your word. I pray that you would guard my lips and guard my mind so that I might think and say precisely what you would have me to say. And I pray for the hearts of us all that we would be attentive to what you have for us here in Psalm 96. So earlier in this week, I was sitting in line in my truck waiting to pick up a lease from school. And it was sort of a, it was a dreary day. It was all, you know, the sky was gray and there were raindrops that were trickling down the windshield. It was, you know, kind of this typical early winter's day in Alabama. Everything looked dead. There was, you know, nothing that was green. And I was sitting there kind of bored, and I was looking at the crepe myrtles that were over there uh, in, the, in, the, in the school parking lot, and they had lost all of their leaves. And as I stared at them for a while, at first glance, it seemed like all of the branches came together in sort of a chaotic interweaving of twigs and branches and that sort of thing. But as I stared at it for a little bit longer, I saw that there was a pattern. If you stared at it long enough, you could see that from the trunk, there grew branches, and then from the branches there grew smaller branches, from each of these grew twigs, and then from those twigs there grew smaller twigs, twigs and so on. And if you look at the way in which they forked, each of the branches was similar to the one that was before it, save for slight variations in angle. And if this pattern were repeated, there would be infinitely many self-same iterations of the pattern. So that no matter how far you stood from it, you would see the same sort of thing. There is a pattern to the branching of trees, and it was little understood until really fairly recently. In 1982, there was this guy whose name was Benoit Mandelbrot, and he released a book called The Fractal Geometry of Nature. And he said that there is this pattern that you can see so often in nature. He said that when you look at tree branches, when you look at river basins, when you look at clouds or mountain ranges or, or blood vessels or coastlines or even the clustering of galaxies and thousands and thousands of other things in nature, there are these similar mathematical patterns. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Everything that is around us in nature is made according to beautiful mathematical patterns, and quite often we can see a particular form of mathematical pattern in nature that is called a fractal. Mandelbrot was interviewed about his book, and uh, he said that this was something that he discovered 
it's not some sort of math that he just made up to explain what he saw. This is, this is what he said. Exploring this set, I certainly never had the feeling of invention. I never had the feeling that my imagination was rich enough to invent all of those extraordinary things on discovering them. They were there, even though nobody had seen them before. It's marvelous. A very simple formula explains all of these very complicated things. Mandelbrot is saying that this pattern has always been there. When you look at the branches of a tree, there is this special sort of a beauty that you see. And everyone being made in God's image can see something of that pattern, even if you failed Algebra 1 completely. You see, your mind is fearfully and wonderfully made so that when you look at the branching of the tree, you see a certain beauty, even if you can't explain it. Well, that beauty, in part, is due to this fractal pattern that is sort of like the fingerprint of its creator. When we think about the beauty of nature, you know, we often would think about how great it is in the springtime when all the flowers are blooming and, and when all of these green colors are arising. Or maybe we think about the colors of fall where you have all of the beautiful reds and the, and the oranges and the yellows and that sort of thing. But even here in the beginnings, beginnings of winter, if you take time to look, you can see remarkable beauty all around you because the world around you still proclaims the glories of the, ones, of the one who created it. The psalmist says in verse 11, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. When you look up at the star-filled sky, when you see the sunset, these are declaring the glories of God. When you look into the canyon that is deep and you see the river down there at the bottom, when you look up at the mountaintops and you see the snow, these are things that proclaim his handiwork. The psalmist says, let the sea roar and all that fills it. When men see the white-capped waves there on the seashore, they are like God's voice going out through, throughout the whole earth. The psalmist says, let the fields exult in everything that is in it. When you're driving down the road and you see that white cotton field, white for harvest, it's like God's words going out to all of the world. The psalmist says, then shall all the trees in the forest sing for joy when you're walking on Monsanto, when you are perhaps even in the Russian taiga, when you see a leafless crepe myrtle you're still witnessing the glory of your God in his creation. Because all of these parts of God's creation remind us of the one who made it. There is a sense in which they all tell the same story. It's like creation was saying, our beauty and our majesty are just sort of like a shadow of the one who made us. Looking at us might be kind of impressive, but the only reason that we're impressive is because we bear the fingerprints of the one who made us. And if you think that we are splendid, you should see our creator, God. The psalmist says, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is infinitely more majestic, infinitely more beautiful than anything that he has created. And so when the Christian goes out and they see the world around them, then that is something that should make our minds go up higher. John Calvin often describes creation as being sort of like a ladder. And so when we look at the things that are out there, our minds are drawn upward so that we are reminded of the one who made it. When you think about the one who made it, when you think about what all he has done, what should you do, according to the psalmist? You should sing, you should praise him, you should worship him, because when you realize what God has done and who God is, it should make you worship him. God's majesty and holiness make us want to sing to the Lord a new song. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. 
when our minds go upward to who God is, when we realize who he is, when we think about what he is like, we are, called, we are driven to praise. What is our God like? Our God is a God who is perfect in everything about him. He is perfectly good. He is perfectly righteous. He is perfectly holy, perfectly just, perfectly faithful, perfectly loving. He is the God who never changes because he is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is all-powerful. He created everything in the, in the span of six days and all very good. He knows everything. He knows everything that happened in the past, everything that is going on now, and everything that will happen in the future. Our God is everywhere. He's at the top of the mountain. He's at the bottom of the sea. He is in the farthest galaxy. And yet the whole universe cannot contain him. When we think about who he is, it should make us praise him. It should make us worship. It should make us sing. So when we think about God's creation, it should make us worship him. When we think about who God is, it should make us worship him. But we also need to think about something else, according to the psalmist. Something else that will drive us to praise. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day today many many years ago there was a group of men sitting out in a field night had set in and probably they were just sitting there and things were quiet except for the contented bleating of their sheep and then all of a sudden an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you this day uh, is born this day in the city of David, or excuse me, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And so these angels are coming and they are making an announcement to the shepherds. They are saying that this Messiah that your people has been waiting for for thousands of years has finally come. Here is the Savior of Israel. Here is the one who is going to save you from your sins. For all of these years, they had been offering sacrifices for their sins. And all of these were pictures of the one who is to come. The long-awaited Savior is finally there. He was the spotless lamb. He was the final sacrifice. He was the one who came to cleanse the sins of his people by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption, says the author of Hebrews. So although we deserve death, by his sacrifice, we are given something. Instead, we are given the gift of eternal life. The shepherds knew that the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament had finally come to Israel. And so what did they do? In light of the fact that their Savior had come, in light of the fact that God had finally sent the one that would save them from their sins, here's what they did. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. When we think of what God does in nature when we think of who God is when we think of the salvation that God has brought through Jesus Christ our Lord we should sing to the Lord bless his name tell of his salvation from day to day that is what this psalm teaches us is that the end of the sermon have we said everything that we should say? What do you think? Is there anything else that might possibly be in this psalm that we haven't yet discussed that is relevant that we need to be talking about? Listen to this. Sing to the Lord, 
all the earth. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Consider the following conversation. Maul, that sure was a good service. Oh, it was, honey. Pastor Jeff, oh, he always has a great sermon. I just love singing all of those Christmas hymns. That's right, honey. Let's go home and let's have us some lunch. What should you do after the worship service is over? What, should, what does the psalm say that you should do after you have worshiped God and indeed is an aspect of your worship. What comes after you get home? Now, Jeff does preach well. We do have good worship music, and there's nothing wrong with having a good lunch after church. But the end of the service should be the beginning of something else, something that sometimes people forget at some point, even perhaps before they've had lunch. Our praise and our worship should always motivate us to something else. What should it motivate us to? According to this psalm, what do you think? It tells us, sing to the Lord all the earth. Is all the earth currently praising God? Or all the people of the earth currently praising God? This psalm tells us, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Did you know that most of the world is still in idolatry? Because everybody who doesn't have Christ as their Savior is an idolater, according to the Bible. Anyone who isn't Presently trusting Jesus has to be trusting something else to give them what they need. And that is what the Bible calls idolatry. Some of them are henotheist. What? Henotheist? What does that mean? Okay, so here's what a henotheist is. It's very easy to understand. So uh, particularly in places like Cana, uh, the Israelites would have had a lot of henotheists around them, and these are people that have a local god. And so we could imagine people in Madison worshiping the god of Madison, and then people over there in Huntsville worshiping the god in Huntsville, and then people in Montgomery having a different god, and this god sort of has power within the area in which it is worshiped, but that power doesn't necessarily go much past Huntsville or Madison or Montgomery or where not. That's called henotheism. And there are a lot of people in the world today that still are henotheist. Well, listen to how the psalmist describes the one true God. He says, but the Lord made the heavens. Here is the one who is the Lord of the earth. That doesn't sound like a henotheistic God to me at all. This is the one who made everything that has been made. He is not a provincial God, but he is the one true God who has all power over everything. And our work on earth will not be done until his praise, praise stretches out through the whole of the earth. There are other people that worship nature. And so you have heard of the Egyptians, you know, perhaps worshiping the sun. Uh, you have heard of people worshiping the moon. Uh, in mainland Japan, uh, traditionally, it was possible to worship, say, the god of a particular river. And so there is a tendency among people throughout the world to worship nature. They see the fingerprints of God, and they start mistaking whatever the thing is for the real god. And they tend to worship it. The sun is glorious, and they worship it, not realizing that there is someone who made the sun. We need to tell them, here is the one who made the river. All of the earth needs to hear that. There are some who have a different idol altogether. Sexual immorality, 
impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. And so Paul is listing off all of these things. And he's saying, these things are idols. Why are they idols? Because they are things that people use to substitute for what they should be getting from God. Listen to this. When you think about people around us, where do they get their sense of satisfaction? There are a lot of people who get their sense of satisfaction from temporary pleasures, things that can be found within this world, right? They don't necessarily get it from the one who made the world. And here's another one. Where do people get their sense of security? Where do people get their sense of security? Is it from their bank account? Is it from their IRA, all the money that they've saved? Or is it from the one who gives all that we have, who owns a cattle on a thousand hills? You see, it is possible for a little bit of inflation to suddenly wipe away the bank account, to make the IRA pretty much worthless. And there's going to be a lot of people, perhaps even in the near future, who are going to have their God fail them. These are people that need to hear about the one true God, the one who actually can give them satisfaction, the one who actually can give them security, who will take care of them always, even into death. Our worship, in a sense, will not be complete until it stretches to the very ends of the earth. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say to the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will come and judge the people with equity. Jesus is coming to judge the world. We must prepare it for that judgment. The world needs to be able to praise and worship him just as we praise and worship him every Sunday morning. We are the ones that must take the gospel to them. Paul, talking about the promise to Abraham, said, in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Jesus was that offspring. He was from the family line of Abraham. And the blessing that he gave is the salvation from sin. This is a salvation that must be proclaimed in order for it to be accepted. The ends of the earth need to hear of it. The places like deepest, darkest Africa. It must go to every nation. Places like Vanuatu and Venezuela. It mean, needs to be proclaimed among every language groups. Uh, people like the Khmer, people like the Kyrgyz. And it even needs to be proclaimed to smaller family lines. You see this? Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. It's not merely that we need to say that, uh, it, it, that it's good enough that we have missionaries in every nation. It is not good enough to say that we have missionaries to every language group. We even need to go farther than that and make sure that the family lines that are even smaller than these language groups have representatives to stand around the throne of the God, uh, around the throne of God one day. The church's mission is not going to be done until the praise of God stretches throughout the entirety of the whole world. So don't let your praise and your worship end as soon as you go home on Sunday morning. Just like those angels on the day that Jesus was born announce his salvation to those who do not know it because when he returns, he will judge the world in righteousness. It is us who must prepare them for this second coming. Let your praise and your worship of God be your motivation. Do you see how it's connected here in the psalm? 
The reason that you go out and tell people about God is because you worship him, because you realize how good he is, because you realize how great his salvation is. That should be the motivation for telling people about God. Missions will end one day, but worship will not. Your friends, your friends, your family, your neighbors, all of these people need to hear about the God who is gracious, gracious and loving towards sinners. Your nation needs to hear about a God that is greater than the gods of pleasure and the gods of money. The world needs to hear that the creator God has sent his son to die in, in their place to pay for their sins. And so motivated by the great goodness of of your majestic God, what will you do? Let us pray. God, we pray that we would make Christ known, both here and in our state and in our country and in places far away. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace. Proclaim the word made flesh. Glory, thanks, and praise to God.